Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Welcome back to Wounded for War. Uh, this morning, we're going to be diving into a new adventure. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys uh, to this morning's uh, talk. We're, we're going to be doing it a little bit different. I'm uh, both recording for a video in which I uh, wounded for war. If you haven't been a part of us and you're just joining us for this video, um, I've been pre-recording these videos to make sure that uh, the content is good, it goes out on time, and uh, it seems like uh, God's pushing me in a new direction where I'm both doing it for recording for YouTube, uh, but also I'm streaming it live on Sunday mornings now on Facebook. So we're going to have both going. I'm hoping that you guys can help us out in promoting uh, YouTube channel by actually subscribing. We can't go live on on uh, YouTube until we actually have more than uh, I think it's a thousand uh, subscribers. But all that to say, let's pray. I want to get into this morning's uh, talk and walk through um, how to overcome pride. That's going to be the nature of our talk today. We're going to talk about how to overcome pride. So let's uh, dive in and uh, and and start with prayer. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you for uh, this morning. For those that are gonna watch the video, for those that are joining us live, Lord, for the people that are seeking to uh, become someone that's not filled with pride. Lord, I know that that's a hard thing to do in this day and age. This world is riddled with pride and arrogance. And Lord, today uh, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to see what your spirit wants to teach us about overcoming pride. Lord, we want to be a useful people in your hand. And so, Lord, I pray that you would get me out of the way and that, Lord, your word would not only be what we study, but that you would allow your word to study our hearts by your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> this morning, if you've been following along with us, we're going through uh, 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. And uh, we're going to look at how to overcome pride, but um, we'll see that Paul answers how to overcome pride by contrasting two areas of Scripture today. Uh, one is our, our, our scripture that we've been going through, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 6 through 13. But we're gonna we're gonna um, take a look at, at Ephesians 3 and why Ephesians 3. We're gonna contrast these two together and just kind of marry them. Um, and the reason why is because uh, one, where we're reading in 1 Corinthians, Paul's given us the problem of pride. But he gives us some answers as to how to avoid pride, but at the same token, one of the most beautiful things I think I see in Paul is that in Ephesians 3, he displays, he's actually putting on display for us what it looks like to be someone who's humble. And so, um, or someone I should say that's overcome pride already. If you know Paul's story, he has a pretty bad uh, past. He has a prideful past. And so it's a good case and study looking at his life. So let's dive in. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things. So what's he talking about these things? We have to go back to what he was talking about earlier. He said, let a man regard us in this manner. And he's talking about leaders because he was dealing with a, a division in the church, right? Um, this guy says he's of Apollos. I say I'm of Cephas. This guy over here says he's from this guy. They were being super arrogant, super prideful, and they were basing it on what teacher they were following. And so he says, hey, let a man regard us leaders in this manner as servants 
of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. So he says, regard us as servants and stewards. And he says, now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and to Apollos, which is one of the other guys that they were pitting Paul against, right? And he says he did it for your benefit. As Corinthian church would hear this, they'd be um, realizing one thing, they don't really care for Paul. Paul's seen as weak, and this Apollos guy was seen as strong. And so they're not fond of Paul. But he says, hey, I, I did this for your benefit. I, I helped you to see that both Apollos and Paul and Peter, all of us leaders, we're all just servants. We're all just stewards. So he applied that to them. And he says that you may learn the meaning of uh, the saying, nothing beyond what is written. So what's he, what's he talking about there? He said, hey, I want you to, to actually be a Christian, but I want you to do it in light of what's written in the scriptures. Not your own plan, not your own idea of what Christianity is all about. You see, uh, we're really to measure everything in life according to God's word and nothing else. That's what the foundation for our belief is. And what our belief comes from is the word of God. So if it comes from there, then we're going to act accordingly, right? And he's saying, hey, don't do anything that's, that's not written in the, in the scriptures, man. Why is he saying that? Because they're judging one another against each other, and that is not in the scriptures to do so. So Paul <clears throat> says, hey, um, just in case <laughs> you don't understand that, he moves it up a notch, and he says, the purpose is, is that none of you become arrogant. I want you to know why he doesn't want you to pit one another against each other. And he says, because I don't want you to become a arrogant, favoring one person over another. For who makes you superior? I love that question. What makes you better? What makes you uh, so great? And and I know right away, probably like myself, uh, you can name off a couple things. Well, I'm better at this. I'm better at that. But here's the thing. He's he's saying, for what makes you superior? What do you have that you did not receive? He goes on to say, if in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? So he's saying, Anything that you had, whether it's a leader of Apollos, right? And a great preacher and teacher. Well, he was gifted by God. He was given his mouth by God, created by God, given the life experiences by God. So, so it was all given to him and he was given to you. So why are you boasting as though it's something you have or something you've done? You see, Paul, <laughs> Paul's letting us know there's a calling of God on leaders, but there's a specific type. How do, we, how do we overcome arrogance that we see in these people? They thought that they were superior. They thought um, that they had made it, right? And, and, um, and if we look over at Ephesians 3, okay, just at that one part where, where he's talking about, hey, man, uh, I'm a servant, and, and other leaders are servants. We're all stewards, and, and just take our, we take our, our cues from the Word of God. Um, why are you thinking that you didn't receive something like the, the, the position you have or the power you have or the prestige you have or the gifts you have? Paul in Ephesians 3 kind of outlines his calling. And it's a good way to look at the contrast. These guys thought that you know, their leaders were great. And here's what Paul says in Ephesians 3, starting in verse 1. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner... Of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. It doesn't sound prestigious, does it? I, Paul the prisoner. He says, If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mysteries, as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read, you, will un you can understand my insights into the mysteries of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Be, uh, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister. Here he goes. Here's his call. Here's his, here's his uh, commissioning. I was made a minister. but 
according to what? According to the gift of God's grace, not his works. He didn't see what he was doing as something great about himself. It was according to the gift of God's grace that he was a minister. You see, Paul understood that it wasn't something he brought to the table. It was actually a total blessing from God that he decided to uh, pour out on Paul. Paul didn't deserve it. He goes on and he says, according to the, uh, the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the, the work of his power, not Paul's power, right? To me. And here's his view of himself. The very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what, the, what is the uh, administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Uh, this is in accordance with the eternal purposes which he carried out in Christ our Lord. Paul, if you listened in that, was very humble in how he believes he was brought into ministry and what li Christian leadership looks like. First, he calls himself a prisoner, and then he says, God's grace over and over. He says, it was given to me. It was revealed to me. It was... Uh, and he even outlines here, revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. He's not arrogant going, yeah, it's just me. You got to listen to me, not that other guy. No, he, he, he includes the other people, whereas the other ones were dividing over individuals. I was made, or how about according to the gift of God's grace, given to me. He says these sorts of things all through there. He's letting us know he doesn't have a position in his mind and heart that say, um, I'm so great, I'm so wonderful. He has a humble heart. Now, Paul contrasts the leadership of Corinth and their experience to the apostles' experience in the next part. And this is really interesting because as you start to think about um, leaders today, I want you to think about the leaders that you know. And I want you to think of which side they may land on, okay? In, in the Corinthian uh, address, he says, you are already full. You are already rich. You've begun to reign as kings without us. He's, he's snarky there. He's, he's got attitude. He's actually, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you just have to be with this holy reverence. Dude, he's being sarcastic to these guys. <laughs> oh, you're you're full. You're rich. You guys are, are kings, man. He says, and I wish you did reign so that I could also reign with you. But here's the difference where he says, for I think God has displayed us, the apostles in last place, like men condemned to die. So you guys are full, man. You're rich. You're, you're knocking it out. You're, you're living your best life now. But we've been put on display. And you say that you're on the same team. You're doing the same job. You're excited about how great you guys are doing. And here, God, for some reason, has put Paul on display as in last place, as a condemned man. And then he says... We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. Now, I, I got to take a minute here because I, you got to get the, the image of what he's saying. And there's a context from history that uh, we need to understand. You see, the word when he says we've become a spectacle to the world, that word spectacle was uh, the word that defined in that day and age when a, a, a battle was over and whoever won that battle was coming back from war. They would have their troops going in back to town and, and the troops would be first and people would be cheering them on, right? And then they would see the, the, uh, the booty or, or the, the things that they had gained from that battle. They, they took all the riches, they took you know, all, the, all the good stuff, right? And brought it back home. Well, at the very end of that, what you would find is you would find uh, the prisoners, that were being brought back and they were actually being escorted to uh, the place where they would die, the Colosseum. So, so when Paul says 
Uh, we've become a spectacle to the world. He's saying, hey, we're like those guys at the end that are literally walking into town as captured prisoners on our way to death. And that's, that's what God has literally seen fit as the image of who we are as believers and leaders in particular. Why? Why would he make them a spectacle in, in being last or being condemned to die? Why? Well, think about it. Jesus, wasn't that his calling? He came and died. But why did he die? So that, so that there could be life for others. He gave his life so that others could have life. And that's what Paul's saying, hey, uh, God see fit, seen fit to, to give me the same calling to actually um, be an image bearer of Christ. And, and you guys are living your best life now. It, something's off. Something's really off. You see, real leaders need uh, real strength. And why? Because they're going to go through some hardships. Paul's alluding to that right off the bat. But we know Paul's story if you know anything about Paul. It's a brutal one. He goes on in the next section of Ephesians 3, where we were contrasting, and he says, in whom we have, and he's talking about Christ, in whom Jesus, in whom we have boldness and confidence, access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are for your glory. For this reason, I bow my knee. So he knows right off the bat, the reason why I'm suffering is because it's for your sake. It's to um, lead by example in what you're going to be called to. It's going to be tribulation, but I don't want you to lose heart. And he's modeling that for us. And we'll see why we don't have to lose heart. But how's he going to keep heart? Well, he says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, not your strength, but from God, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Paul says, you're going to need real strength. Paul says, hey, I know what it's like, and you're going to need someone praying for you that God would strengthen you, not on the outward. You're, you're not going to the gym just to work out a muscle. No, he's talking about working out your spiritual muscles, working out the, the, the things that are more important than just physical being. One day this, uh, this body's going to die. I'm so uh, ridiculously close to uh, the understanding of that. I skateboard uh, quite a bit going later on today with my kids and and you break yourself doing that sport man and i swear uh it's by my own stupidity but the reality is that at times i feel like god's taking me piece by piece whether it be a rolled ankle or a, a broken collarbone or you know a bruised heel or a, you know bad back he those things are all great and, and you could have all the vitamins, you could have eat right paleo, you can uh, have uh, hydrate yourself, but you're going to die hydrated with vitamins and, and on a paleo diet. You're still going to die. And he's wanting you to be strengthened on your inner man so that you make it to the finish line, but you don't just make it to the finish line, you make it where you can hear, well done, good and faithful servant from the king of kings. Why does he draw out the strength that you're going to need? Why? Because... Um, there's a true cost to discipleship. One thing that's really horrible about uh, our society today in Christianity is that we sold an easy believism in the 90s, and that was just say a prayer and you're good to go. But that's not true. See, your, your beliefs inform your actions. At least they should. So whatever you believe, in other words, should come out in your life. You know, if I believe eating right is the best thing for me, truly believe it then I'm, you're not going to catch me with a, sneak, a, a Snickers or a Twinkie, right? You're going to catch me with carrots and, and celery. Well, there's a true cost to discipleship. Paul says in verse 10 of Corinthians chapter 4, he says, uh, uh, yeah, verse 10, we are fools for Christ. He contrasts again. He's getting snarky, man. He's, he's got that um, sarcasm down. He says, we are fools for Christ, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You're distinguished, but we are dishonored. 
Up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor working with our own hands. You know, he's talking to these Christian leaders in Corinth that were all off basis. And, and don't miss it, man. He says, you guys think you're wise and you're strong and you're distinguished. And so you won't even take a job you, you, that's beneath you. Paul says, man, I'm working with my own hands to support myself while I'm teaching you the gospel so that you know the legitimacy of the message. It led him to be hungry, thirsty, poor, clothed poorly, roughly treated, and homeless. How does your walk look? Is it always a bed of roses? Now maybe you're not following Christ. Maybe you have an easy believism. Is your pastor or leader um, living his best life now? Is he living a bed of roses? I, I, Paul doesn't seem to advocate that that's a reality for those that follow. Not believe. Just. But follow. If that's how they're going to live parts of their life. You know, there's a payoff, though. I know. Everyone sits back and goes, well, that's a heavy price. I don't want to pay no price like that. Why the heck would I want to do that? There's a payoff. Paul alludes to it and talks about it in Ephesians 3, in verse 17, where he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love. Not, and I, I, I really want to be careful here, not rooted and grounded in just the Word of God though that's important. Not rooted and grounded in your doctrine. Not rooted and grounded in, in ch church tradition. But rooted and grounded in love. That you may, because of that, be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses understanding or knowledge. That you may be Filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, Paul understood that if, if, you, if you go through hardship, what it's going to do. You ever heard of foxhole mentality? When you're in battle together, your hearts get just knit together in a way that's unique. You're back to back. You're fighting. You, you only have each other to count on. Well, guess what? When, when you're in battle and you're like Paul, you're all alone. And, and, and people, even in the church, are, are you know um, rejecting you. And you only have the Lord to lean on. You get that foxhole mentality with him. You see, you start to depend on him in a very real way. And then you start to learn how much love he has for you. You see, when, when you're drowning and you see the lifeguard up there, you kind of walk to the beach and you go to the lifeguard and you think, yeah, I'm safe. Okay. But you know who knows they're safe? Is the one who's tested that. When, when you start to go under and you see the guy dive into the water and he, and he reaches or he, she reaches out and grabs you and saves you and pulls you up. It's not till that moment that you know that you're safe no matter what happens. There's always a bit of question in the back of your mind. Will they see me when I'm drowning? It's not till then. Now, with Paul, Paul had gone through so many things and yet he's still thriving. He's still understands God's love for him in a new way because he's been through a lot with him. That's the payoff that not only you would know that, but that through your life of sacrifice, others would know that. That's what Paul understood. You see, he was unashamed of the gospel because he knew the benefit that it brought for every believer. 
He says, when we're reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. That, my friends, if you're aspiring to leadership, is the best pitch I can give you, by the way. If you want to be a Christian leader, you might as well get yourself a badge that says, like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. You're not going to be, if you're following Jesus and you're not building your brand or your church or your um, your thought of what life, your best life should be, if you're literally following Jesus, it's going to lead you to some hardships. There, there's going to be some great times too. And he, he, there's nothing like, I'm sure, standing at the edge of the, the river for, for Moses and going, holy crap, I'm about to die. There's a whole army back there and I'm at the edge of the water and I can't take these people across. That's the scariest moment. But can you imagine when the ocean opened up? When things started to split? You see, it's not until you're dependent on God that you're going to see the miracles of God and you're going to see why he is so good. And when you see it, can you imagine? They see the water split. They walk across. They look back. And as their enemies come in, boom, wave collapses on them. Tell me you wouldn't come away from that. Super, super encouraged and knowing that you are loved by God. You know, he does those sorts of things in people's lives as you submit. You're going to go through hardship. I've been through a boatload of it. But there's nothing like being comforted from the one who comforts so that you could be comforted in a way that you could comfort others. You know, he refers to himself, himself as garbage in the scum of the earth. But don't forget, Paul was responsible for writing some of the most influential writings that would change the lives of millions and billions. So, how can you cure or overcome pride? Like Paul, you need a right perspective of yourself. You need a right perspective of God. Those two things we saw riddled throughout there. That either you can have a wrong perspective of God, he's too little, and a right and a wrong perspective of yourself, you're too high like the Corinthian leaders. And Paul's going to correct you through the word of God. Or you can humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you in due time. That's the invitation. You know, I want you to remember something too, by the way. Uh, Paul is not just anybody when he's talking about this. Don't forget, Paul understands a good perspective of who God is and who he is. Why? Because of that one moment of grace where God broke through to Paul. You see, Paul was, Paul was on, a, on a road, on a mission, commissioned to go out and kill Christians. Paul was right on his way to go kill God's own people, his possession, his, his love, what he gave his life for. And yet, man, if you're coming after my kids, I'm not holding back, dude. You're getting a nine millimeter in the nose. That's not what God did. You see, while Paul's at his worst moment going to kill God's own people, God met him with grace. He met him right where he needed to be met. What road are you on? Where's your life leading? Is it possible that God has a different plan for you, a different walk, a different, different life? I think the, uh, the takeaway today is that uh, we need to check our own hearts. You know, we read the scripture. Let the scripture read you. How are you doing with pride? Don't be humbled um, by circumstances beating you down. Today's a choice. Today you have an opportunity to 
humble yourself before the Lord. And you know, it's not an all in type of thing. I, I know that people preach that. You just got to give your life all to, to God. And, and then he, if it, if you did it right, then he accepts you. The truth is every one of the apostles that we watch, they, they took steps. It was a process. And I would invite you to take that first step to say, Lord, I believe I may have it wrong. That you may have a better life for me. And Jesus, I want to see if you're real. I want to know your ways. I want to understand what Paul's talking about here. I want my eyes and my heart open to who you are. And so, if that's you, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would open your heart, open your eyes, open your mind, open your spirit to become alive and awake in Him. And that what would be the the byproduct would be that you would become a, a follower, a doer of the Word. That you would become someone who values the Word of God. Don't forget, one of the very first uh, things he said to the Corinthians, I, I want you guys to... to um, to learn from us the meaning of the same, nothing beyond what is written. Measure everything in life according to the word of God, nothing else. Let me pray for us. Father, I, I come before you and I thank you this morning for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, that like Paul, you want to meet every one of us on that road, Lord, where we're rebelling against you. We're, we're possibly even going hard, not only just against you, but um, kind of coming at you in a bad way. Or if maybe in the past, Lord, we gave up or gave in to some things we shouldn't have, Lord. I just want to pray that, Lord, each one of us that are sitting here, humbling ourselves, putting ourselves before your word, and allowing you to search our hearts, Lord, that you would shape and mold us, help us to take the next step in our walk with you, wherever we're at, Lord. I praise you and I thank you that your Holy Spirit continues to seek us out. That you don't give up even when we give up. That you're faithful even when we're not. Lord, for those that have been far from you for a while, Lord, I pray you would draw them back. Like Peter on the shore, Lord, you would go meet them where they're at and remind them of who they are in you. I praise you and I thank you for those that will make that decision. And I pray, God, that you would sovereignly carry them step by step to the encouragement that you intend on encouraging them with, that they would continue walking forward and seeing the life you have for them. I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, uh, I want to offer, uh, this is why I'm going to do live from here on out. And like I said, please go on the YouTube channel Wounded for War and subscribe. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers on that channel so that we can actually live stream on both. Until then, I have to record the videos and send them out, which is fine. Um, but if you want to help us out in reaching people with uh, the good news of Jesus, we definitely would love if you can subscribe to both channels on YouTube and on Facebook. Also, every week, 9 a.m., I'm going to be uh, here Sunday mornings doing the same thing. Uh, we are also coming up soon into uh, the end of April, I believe. We're going to be starting a new class midweek, I'm going to be going through what's called the uh, Emotionally Healthy Disciple. It's a, a course that has two parts to it. It's Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and Emotionally Healthy Relationships. You know, in a day and age like today where uh, we've just had the worst world uh, pandemic and, and chaos and, and all kinds of madness going on, uh, I think what's going to be super helpful to each one of us is to get some some basic tools on on what it looks like to be healthy again in our spirituality. Um, kind of going back to some foundational tools. And then also uh, having a course that's designed around, um, and I've honestly never even heard of this in a church, but um, emotionally healthy relationships. 
that we would learn how to interact with one another and love one another well. You know, those are some things that people don't really spend a lot of time with in the body of Christ. We talk a lot about church, we do a lot of eating together, we do a lot of hanging out, do a lot of singing, but he said that my house should be a house of prayer. And so you'll see me popping on throughout the week, um, just praying for people. I want to open it up in a minute to prayer, um, but those courses are designed to help you get to uh, the next step in your walk. So look out for those. We're going to have some invites. Uh, it'll be something that's free of charge online, just like this. Um, just being able to uh, grow in the grace of uh, uh, our Lord through his word and a great study. We'll see you guys next time at Wounded for War. Until then, love you. <laughs>